This is First You Hustle, a podcast from the Columbus College of Art and Design meant to help students and creative professionals put their expertise to use. And this is an episode in our three-part art preservation series. Wait, this doesn't sound like art preservation series music. Let's change that. Ah, much better. Join us now for part one of this three-part series featuring professionals in the field of art preservation from a recent live panel discussion on campus. With the panel event stretching over 90 minutes, we've divided up the presentation to feature each panelist's responses individually. For this episode, Sarah Marsum. Sarah has nearly 10 years of experience working for historical sites and nonprofits and specializes in creative outreach strategies that connect people to the past. As a heritage resource consultant, she develops educational workshops, interpretive plans, researches properties, and much more that you'll hear about in this presentation. In 2018, she was recognized by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as the recipient of the American Express Aspire Award during the 2018 National Preservation Awards and as an honoree on the inaugural 40 Under 40 People Saving Places list. Also, Get a notepad and pencil ready. At the end of the presentation, Sarah shares multiple resources, associations, and conferences that will help you jumpstart your career in preservation. Also, make sure you listen to our other two episodes to hear from Lindsay Jones' experience in historic preservation through construction and repair, Chloe Singer as an archivist, and John Delia's work in preservation through real estate. Now, let's join Namisha Bott, our host, in the prestigious Kinzani Auditorium on the campus of Columbus College of Art and Design. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and start. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we are here to talk to you about careers in preservation, specifically as art grads, and what that can mean for you making connections from your art background into preservation as a career. So my name is Namisha. I'm actually cataloging an instruction librarian here at CCD. So if you've seen my friendly face in the library, that is why. I'm going to have the panelists all introduce themselves and maybe give like one or two sentences describing what you do. Sarah Marsum, I'm a heritage resource consultant. I work for myself as a sole proprietorship and I do a myriad of things to make history fun, engaged, active, and relevant in your life today. So how many of you have actually heard of preservation or like the word preservation or know what it is? Cool, because it can be really convoluted, right? So the definition that I pulled, historic preservation is a con conversation with our past about our future. It provides us with opportunities to ask what is important in our history and what parts of our past can we preserve for the future. And really, preservation can be the physical act of saving things or creating programs, creating content, um, ways to connect with the community in order to keep ideas alive. And really, while we're talking with our panelists here, we're going to highlight the ways that they specifically, through our, their jobs and their passions, are keeping ideas alive through preservation and the arts. So for our first question, um, Sarah, if you want to start us off, what was your educational or occupational journey like and how did you get to where you are now? I went for an undergraduate degree in Parks and Rec Management from Northern Arizona University and I quickly realized that I didn't want to people complain about their blisters to me while hiking or them potentially dying on me. So I thought about what's connecting me to parks and other places like this, and I realized that I really like the exploration to discover lesser known stories that you didn't learn about textbooks. I have vivid memories growing up of visiting Mesa Verde in Colorado and climbing up the ladders to the cliff dwellings, and my dad almost got stuck, which was pretty hilarious. Um, so I did an internship at this uh, beautiful 1904 Arts and Crafts mansion and I just fell in love. I loved the decorative arts. This home was built out of local ponderosa pine and volcanic rock and just the design and the story that was told through it. I also only took art history classes in college so I kind of started to connect the dots there and I graduated in 2010 when basically nobody would hire somebody with a parks and rec degree so I was a nanny for a year while figuring out what's next um, and then I ended up getting a master's in historic preservation up in Michigan where I did everything from working at the Henry Ford estate I had an office in Henry Ford's old bathroom which was kind of funky um, where I created children and adult programming to working for a national 
National Park, actually, um, the River Reza National Battlefield Park, where the entire site had been destroyed since 1812. A paper mill had been built on it, and then that had been demolished. So I created an entire plan on how the site could be re-envisioned to tell the story. So I created a concept of how you could build ghost structures um, that paid homage to the style of homes that were likely there, and then the focus would largely be on the gardens that were part of the French long lots. So I got a really diverse experience, and I also volunteered at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, which has some of the coolest programming for engagement, and that's when I started to really think, historic sites have really boring activities. It's basically somebody talking at you while you're walking around on a tour, or it's a lecture. Uh, so I started to further develop my ideas of how to creatively engage people. So that's kind of what eventually led me down here to Ohio. And we've got some visuals behind us Ooh. of you being involved in sewing and doing workshops, preservation workshops, and coloring book projects. Yeah, so um, I really see a lot of value in tactile educational experiences. For example, when I worked for the German Village Society for the German Village Historic District, which isn't too far away from CCAD's campus, the brick sidewalks are a death trap. Trees have been uprooting them. People are tripping and literally breaking limbs. And we kept hearing from people, whether they were tourists or residents, please fix these sidewalks. So I um, created an opportunity for people in the neighborhood to get hands on and actually invest in their neighborhood with their time and their energy to relay the sidewalks. And it was just so much fun because you'd have these like 80 year olds just cleaning bricks and hanging out and telling stories about the neighborhood. Or I'd have middle schoolers where I could connect it to their geometry lessons or their German language classes and how what we're standing on today, it's built to last for a reason. Um, or I always love giving tours to little kids because they get really twinkly eyed. Um, so how do you go beyond just turning them into architectural detectives? How do you get into the classroom to sustain the meaning? Because statistically it's been proven that actual historic site visits for youth um, that are under 13 or so, that doesn't actually make a sustaining impact on their lives. You have to figure out how to get it better integrated into the curriculum. So I started to train teachers on how to use historic resources, whether it's from the archives or libraries or what the historical society did to activate. But since quitting the German Village Society a few years ago um, and starting my own consulting business, I finally fused my love of sewing, which started from age of six. I took private not private lessons, group lessons, when I lived in Honduras as a kid. And I realized that I could use sewing, which is a traditional trade, which not as many people are doing anymore, and create stuff from it. So um, the visuals on the screen on the right is a recent Sew Modern workshop. I partnered with Modern Phoenix Week and the textile company Spoonflower, which is able to print custom designs. And we did a design competition for people to do a contemporary design inspired by the mid-century modern movement. And we had about 600 submissions from around the world. The winner, Cecilia Mock, was from Australia. And then during the workshop at Modern Phoenix Week, we talked about the history of women and how they designed textiles in the mid-century modern movement. And people don't know who Ruth Adler Cheney is. People don't know all these wonderful women and the influence they had on the modern home on the broader scale at all. If you know one, it's Florence Knoll from Knoll Textiles, but they don't know all these other people that were creating textiles through block printing at home, block printing for mass production, weavings. So it was a really fun, you know, way to have a cultural conversation conversation over craft and fuse new partnerships. Um, and then I also saw dolls in the image of Jane Jacobs, and she lives all over the world now, which is wonderful. I just shipped one to New Zealand recently, because um, Jane Jacobs is the modern founder, essentially, of the historic preservation movement, but most people don't know who she is. A recent documentary, Citizen Jane, came out, and that's shed some light on her, but people aren't aware of the impact she has on our lives today. So I sold a doll as a way to start 
start telling her story and then people started wanting to buy her. So I partnered with a illustrator, Shannon May, for the design and it's been a hit. I'll have a new doll by the end of the year that Shannon's partnering with me again on and every doll I use actually or so and sell um, fundraises for tiny scholarships for people with big dreams to enable people to attend the National Trust for Historic Preservation Conference because it's really cost prohibitive for anybody who's wanting to do continuing education to attend conferences or workshops. So this is my tiny way of doing it and it's fun and different and it's been opening doors for me and I've got, I, like later on this year, um, I've got a workshop in Columbus, Indiana. I highly recommend watching the movie Columbus if you haven't. It has John Cho. You even see his butt in it. <laughs> That's your fun fact. <laughs> um, but beautiful mid-century architecture. So I've actually partnered with their library and I'm designing homages to Cleo Rogers, who the library's named after, but nobody really knows who Cleo is because they're so fixated on I Am Pei being the architect of it. So now we're telling the story of Cleo, why the library's named after her, and we're gonna do hands-on workshops. I'm gonna be do teaching block printing to middle schoolers, and they're gonna do block prints inspired by the local architecture. I'm gonna do a stitch and bitch with adults where we stitch and bitch about the lack of representation of women in the Columbus, Indiana stories, because it's all about the male architects of the area. And I love the architecture, it's beautiful, but not enough people are recognizing the fact that um, Xenia Miller, who, or, yeah, Xenia Irwin is tied to the Miller house, and she actually cross-stitched Alexander Gerard designs with her crochet club, and how cool is that? So, I don't know. I try and find unconventional ways to illustrate through hands-on activities. Um, I've been pitching ideas like wanting to do quilting workshops to do storytelling of the queer community because quilting was a huge part of the AIDS healing crisis in the 1980s through the 90s. Or, um, for example, I recently visited some Japanese internment camps and some Great Depression sites, and what I kept discovering was people who've been in really tough circumstances have shown resiliency through the art that they've created, through furniture design, textile design. So I'm really trying to find more interactive ways, because we all know if you're making something, that'll create a bigger connection. So I also do like research and like hang out in the library a lot, but you know, I rather not just sit in a room by myself getting paler by the moment. <laughs> All right, so our next question is, how did you figure out that you wanted to do what you're doing now? And how did you figure out your very particular niche? If you feel like you want to answer well, or not. I, so I, I do do a lot of research. Um, I do historic designations. I do historic tax credits. But I've been doing all this research. I'm like, great, I'm doing all this research about this really cool place for it to go on a shelf. Nobody else is going to know this. This history might potentially die with me. Um, or for example, I was doing research in, about downtown Mansfield and I discovered that downtown Mansfield, their park downtown was actually a um, hot spot for gay men in the 1950s and 60s to meet for sexual encounters and cops caught them and would prosecute them for illegal acts of sodomy. So I was doing this historic designation for the area, working on it with some other people, and the editor boiled it down to like two paragraphs. And I'm like, this history is so incredibly valuable about the discrimination of people. And now it's barely gonna even be on a shelf. So really, all of my degrees, all of my experiences, a lot of it's helped me understand the connectivity to the past and how it can create informed, thoughtful citizens today. It can impact every aspect of our daily lives from how we choose to shop, where we choose to live, what type of vote we wanna do. So I just really have tried to focus as I've built my practice, but also as I've worked at different organizations on their staff, how to create dynamic, energetic ways to tell these stories of the past so that they're not just left in a book that somebody might pick up on a shelf or left hidden away in an unorganized archives. So if you came from an arts background, have you melded that, we've kind of talked about this already, but have you melded that with your current profession or career path? And I think all the art history classes I took, you know, 
if you take a singular art history class, which I hope you're required to do, you learn very specifically about how the period of time you know, influenced the style of art, the materials that were used. And I think art history does a really great job at connecting the past to a tangible object and the past to the present because you look at things from a full spectrum of time. Impressionism, you know, evolved from realism and cubism and all that stuff. Compared to history, if you just learn, read a typical history book, then it's very much like this happened at this moment of time and it's not necessarily connected to the bigger spectrum or individual objects. I didn't learn about Serpent Mound in my history classes. I learned about it in my art history classes. So I really think art history was a great way to better think through the cultural influence of our tangible universe, which is a huge part of historic preservation. Yeah, I remember taking art history classes in undergrad and just thinking, well, I don't want to be a professor and I don't want to write a book about this. So I'm just remembering facts and regurgitating them for a test and then what? What do I do with that, right? And I think it's so cool that with preservation, like you said, Sarah, you're taking what you know from history and what you know from art history and being able to actually use that in a practical way, either on particular projects or conservation or creating programming for someone. So I think that's a really good point. How do the arts play a part in your career presently or possibly for your future occupational goals? Sarah and John, I was kind of thinking of you with this question. Clearly, I'm trying to do arts-based workshops. Um, I, historic preservation, by and large, his, history nerds like to stay in their little bubbles. And they're not the best at partnering with people. And if we want to gain a greater appreciation for the field, we need to make friends. And so I've done a lot of collaborations um, with arts organizations, like I said, Spoonflower, Textile Printing Company, or ArtLink actually paid for my workshop in Phoenix, or I've gotten grants through the Ohio Arts Council. They, you know, there's a lot of arts funding or arts partnerships because people want to either use traditional art skills to bring something to life or they like that the art can tell a story. Um, so I'm just trying to make preservation fun. That's basically what I do. That should be my business tag. But um, yeah, I just, you know, I think there's a really great value at, for example, um, doing an archives workshop where you get to use the archival images in a unique way and that's a great way to learn about the archival resources. You know, there's a lot of ways to bring things to life through the arts and arts is empowerment and you'll have that physical reminder of that moment in time forever. So what are the unique ways that CCAD students can lend their talents to your line of work? I think it's incredibly valuable to explore opportunities. Something that may not seem like the right fit initially could be the thing that makes you realize where you should end up. I interned in a collections department at a historic site, um, the Department of Transportation. I tried out all these different pieces of the puzzle, not just to learn from them, but to understand where my passion truly lied. And the other key takeaway is that collaboration is really key. Whether you decide that you wanna make it on your own with your own business, you know, maybe it's not just creating your own individual content that fuels your fire, maybe it's collaborating with these different organizations to help them achieve their goals and be a piece of their puzzle as well because you know not everybody can have a graphic designer on staff or something or a videographer but there's these special individual projects that you can assist with them um, either with them through out of pocket or through grants there's really great opportunities and I see arts becoming more and more intertwined with preservation whether it's through conservation work um, preserving the past art or creating new art to storytell in neighborhoods like John's talking about or otherwise. There's really great dynamic ways to think it through. I'd encourage looking at Main Street programs because they're the ones who are again 
the most crazy I've seen. Um, down in Marietta, Ohio, they even have an ice art festival every winter, That's and good. it's a huge, they do fire and ice, apparently it's crazy. I'm gonna go one year. So just think outside the box. What advice do you wish you had gotten as an adolescent or college student before embarking on your career? I basically grew up not wanting to talk to people. <laughs> just super introverted and just wanting to hang out and read books by myself. Um, and in college, I was kind of forced into taking a communication course. And I know that's benefited me greatly because it's helped me understand how to take my thoughts and help them resonate with different types of audiences. So I'd really encourage trying to find communication courses to help you sell yourself, your objects, you know, your ideas. I send out pitches every single week and I have to be able to communicate these visions of these bigger projects or singular workshops that I want to produce. And I would highly encourage looking toward that. What advice do you wish you had gotten as an adolescent or college student before embarking on your career? Just because we look great on the internet doesn't <laughs> yes. mean we're not having bad days or struggles. And yeah, don't compare yourself to somebody who's like 20 years older or even 10 years older. Uh, I know I'm really guilty of that as a 29 year old. I consider my peers like 50 year olds and I'm like, wait, I they know. have like 30 years of experience Double on me. I shouldn't be there yet. Um, it's good to have those goals, but you know, it all happens in due time with work and effort and building those connections. Like Lindsay was saying, you know, like connections are key. You all get gold stars because you're here. That shows that you want to learn things, that you want to meet new people. Um, but you got to get out there and you got to meet people. That's incredibly vital. I cannot tell you the number of jobs that I have learned through purely from talking to people that aren't posted on websites. It's about building that network and helping people know that you are the right one for that job, whatever that is. Is there anything, if you haven't already said it, that you would like CCAD students to know leaving this or after listening to this that they should know when navigating a career in preservation if they today were like, I am now going to pursue preservation. Is there anything that you would like to tell them when they are embarking on their journey? I have super practical advice. Um, look up Heritage Ohio. They're the statewide nonprofit for historic preservation. Um, they do offer work study internships. Uh, there's also the local nonprofit Columbus Landmarks Foundation. They have very low cost workshops that you can take. Like Lindsay said, she sometimes facilitates them, whether you want to learn a hand-on skill or something else. There's also the Ohio History Connection, which is based here in Columbus. Their internships are currently unpaid, um, but um, you could potentially could, could just consider volunteering a few hours each week there, something that's low bar. Um, they have a really cool collections department. They have um, reenactors, if that's your thing. They have um, movie nights. They have all kinds of cool different stuff. So those are um, three great resources locally that you could consider. And um, also the Young Ohio Preservationist. We offer free and low cost events. You can keep up with us on Facebook and Instagram. We have done everything from letterpress workshops where we letterpress preservation themed postcards to biking tours to happy hours and everything in between. So it's a great way to experience and learn different pieces of preservation to like we've kept saying like experience things and figure out what makes you want to find that niche. Oh, and look up the Ohio Museum Association on their website. They regularly are posting jobs and internships, paid and unpaid, on there. Uh, they have a lot of preservation-minded jobs, um, like or like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame up in Cleveland. They have paid internships, and you get to handle rock star outfits, and that sounds pretty badass to me. I wish I could be in school and eligible for that. Um, 
So that's another really great resource for connectivity. And then they have an annual conference as well, and so does Heritage Ohio. Heritage Ohio's, if you volunteer, you can attend for free. It's going to be in Newark, Ohio, just 40 minutes away this year. And the Ohio Museum Associations, I'm not as familiar with theirs, but they also have annual conferences as well here in the state. So those are some great local assets. Yeah, um, so Sarah mentioned young Ohio preservationists. We're based in Columbus here. And um, we, like she said, we, um, we put together various events every month. We definitely have at least one thing every month. Um, but you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Young Ohio Preservationists. And we always post all of our event information if you want to just show up and say hi, um, making connections, trying to see if there's someone that you really want to connect with. That's really what we're all about. Uh, look up the Association for Preservation Technology. They're a wonderful international organization that has um, lots of free source information in addition to some paywall information about hands-on trades. Uh, Lindsay and I had the opportunity to attend that conference last year and blew my little mind. <laughs> A great free resource you could take advantage of while in school is an organization called Historicor. It's Historia and then C-O-R-P-S. Um, they offer free weekend workshops all over the country. And as long as you can get yourself there, they'll feed you and they'll provide a campsite or a bunk site. And then you get to do hands-on work. And you know in advance what type of work it'll be. So I did a weekend with them and I learned how to use a Japanese handsaw. And a group of ladies, we raised a huge piece of lumber over 30 feet feet in the air with just a rope and we got to help rebuild part of a building. It was a, just a really great experience and get a little bit of hands-on knowledge on a very specific type of skill. But th theirs, is, theirs is always free um, and I cannot speak highly enough about the um, guy who started that nonprofit. He's wonderful. Yeah, that's a really, really another thing I would have done. Um, PreserveNet, if you go there, I think it's Cornell. Just search PreserveNet. PreserveNet. Anyway, um, they have a job and internship board, too, um, if you're looking for more potential career experience related to that type of stuff, they'll sometimes have stuff up there. And you can even, as a student, join Historic Preservation Professionals on Facebook. Uh, we have a lot of students on there who ask for career advice. Um, jobs are posted there. And it's a great way to just kind of see what's popping up in the world that might be available for you and what current events are and what people who are working in the field are currently discussing right now today. Um, another option for internships is the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Their website is savingplaces.org. They have paid interns internships at their different offices around the country and their internships vary greatly. For example, last summer some of their interns got to travel along Route 66 doing photo documentation and a story and they got to pick their storytelling topics. Um, so one person was really interested in African American sites along um, Route 66 so she just researched that and took photos of them. Um, there's other internships where there are hands-on op opportunities. Um, there's currently one open for the HOPE crew um, that's hands-on preservation education. Um, so there's currently an internship available through there as well. So I hope that was helpful for you. And if you have any other questions, feel free to find us after the panel. We have our emails up there if you want to contact, to contact us that way. Chloe and I are here all the time. So if you see <laughs> our friendly faces around, don't feel shy. You can just talk to us there. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening and make sure you tune in to our other episodes on this series to hear from other areas of art preservation. It is a wide career field, so learn from the variety of experiences our panelists have had by tuning into the full series. Take care.